I have a question for you. What does Jesus look for in those who follow him? Have you ever thought about that very important question? What does Jesus look for in those who follow him? Our text today will seek to provide an answer to that fundamental, important question. What does Jesus look for in those who follow him? I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 8. And we're going to drop down to verse 18 and begin there. What does Jesus look for in those who follow him? We might begin to answer that by saying, first, Jesus looks for those who are not concerned about personal comfort. Jesus looks for those who are not concerned about personal comfort. Look with me at verse 18 through 20, Matthew chapter 8. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. Then a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus looks for those who are not concerned about personal comfort. Here is a scribe, a teacher of the law, who comes to Jesus and is quite eager to indicate that he'll follow Jesus no matter what. But it's apparent from Jesus' response to this man that Jesus doesn't trust him. He's, he's too eager. He hasn't counted the cost. He may well have been influenced by all the miracles and deliverances that had just taken place earlier. We see that earlier in the chapter. The scribe has thrilled to what Jesus can do, but like so many, impressed with the miracles, but not necessarily the person. And so this man says, I'll follow you. I've got a name. I'm a scribe, but I'll I'll gain more fame. I'll be known by others when I follow you. Now Jesus, in his response, indicates that he wasn't trusting the heart of this man. In fact, if you go over to John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, and you'll see there that Jesus did not always believe in the faith of other people. He didn't always trust what other people were saying. Look with me, John chapter 2, beginning verse 23. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. They saw the miracles. But Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself, that is Jesus, knew what was in man. Jesus knew and he knows what is in the human heart. The heart is deceitful. Jesus knew that. And so Jesus does not trust this man because he says to him, the birds of the air have their nests, the foxes have their holes, the animals, the birds are taken care of, but the Son of Man, that's Jesus, he designates himself as the Son of Man. This is a title pointing to the fact that he is the Messiah, the Anointed One. He is God, he is deity. Daniel 7 emphasizes that. 
But the Son of Man also indicates that He is man. He is a perfect man. So in the Son of Man, Jesus is deity. He is also humanity. He says, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay His head. Think of it. And when He says nowhere to lay His head, He's pointing to the fact that He he owned nothing. He didn't have a residence. He did not have a house. He was able to sleep in various places, and there were friends who provided for Him, but He didn't own anything. His lifestyle, the lifestyle of Jesus, was meager, to say the least. And he was also always on the move. So he'd have to lay his head in various places wherever he could. The foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Jesus is challenging this man who is so quick to say, I'll follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. But Jesus challenges him. Jesus says to the man in so many words, count the cost. Count the cost. Jesus looks for Those who are not concerned about what? Personal comfort. That's the idea of the foxes have holes and the birds have nests. Jesus looks for those people. He looks for you and for me that we might not be concerned about our personal comfort. And that's especially a word to us in the great United States of America. We can get spoiled so easily, so quickly, with personal comfort. Several years ago, I was at a Bible camp in Minnesota, and in my foolishness, I thought I could join in the softball game that was going on there. Now, you'd never think that I would be foolish or silly, but I joined in that softball game and came time for me to bat, and my pride took over, and I was going to hit that softball no matter what, to let all these other guys around here and some of the gals just see that the one who was speaking at camp also knew something about playing softball. So I hit the ball, and it it was a line drive out toward right field. It fell in, wasn't caught, and I raced to first base. And then pride took over. I'm going to stretch this into a double. And I rounded first, and I was going towards second as fast as I could go. And I got to second base all right. Didn't even have to slide. I got there. If I had slid, that would have been another story, but I didn't slide. But you know what happened? As I came to second, I realized that I had just pulled a muscle in one of my legs. In those days, I had muscles in my legs. (laughs) It was searing pain. So much so that I told those that I'm going to have to leave. I'm going back to my room. I'm not, I wouldn't be able to, if somebody hits the ball and wants me to run to third, I'm not going to be able to do it. So I hobbled off the field and went to my room all by myself. No one was there. My wife wasn't even there to console me and minister to me and help me get out the ice pack. I'm all by myself. She may have said, if she'd been there, it serves you right. (laughs) So there I was, and I was supposed to speak that evening. And I went, how am I going to get up and speak? I mean, I can hardly move. 
Well, God gave me the grace to get up and speak, although it, it was a challenge. But what, what was happening in all of that? I confess to you that it was my pride that wanted to turn that single into a double and get the acclaim of the teams, both teams. It was my pride. Pride can be a terrible taskmaster. And what we see with this first man, his pride was in full bloom. His is pride on steroids. Because he says, I'll follow you, Jesus, wherever you go. Think of that. That's quite a statement. And Jesus says, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. You don't know where all I'm going, and I have no place to lay my head. Because to follow Jesus means that pride has to be slain by the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives, where we repent of that pride that gets us into trouble, that makes us think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. His pride made him want to make this display of total commitment to Jesus. What does Jesus look for in those who follow him? Jesus looks for those who are not concerned for personal comfort. Personal comfort. Is there something that God is dealing with you, calling you to do, but your comfort comes in to the picture? Maybe He's seeking to stretch you beyond the so-called comfort zone. But there's a second man here. The second man. And notice verses 20 and 21. Back in our text, Matthew 8, verse 20, Jesus, or rather 21, another of the disciples said to him, said to Jesus, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. Now we know in that time, in that culture, it was a weighty responsibility to care for the burial of a father. But this also, the way that it's stated here, indicates that what is being used here is kind of a proverb from that day. To go and bury your father did not have to do with whether your father was dead or alive. To go and bury your father meant that you wanted to be there to make sure you got your share of the estate. You wanted to check out the estate. That was so critical. So we don't know whether this father was dead or alive. doesn't make any difference because notice what it says there in verse 21 another of the disciples these disciples are simply learners they're followers they want to follow Jesus in some way they're not the original 12 disciples they're simply people interested in Jesus for whatever reason another of the disciples said to him Lord permit me first permit me first there it is permit me first go and bury my father to check on that estate. After all, uh, there's going to be financial gain for me. Permit me first, but first. There it is, but first. Someone has called this the but first syndrome. I'll follow you, Lord, but first I've got to do this. 
But first, I've got to take care of this over here. But first, but first, but first. And that, loved ones, is not discipleship. That is not commitment when other things, even priorities in life, ordinary priorities of life, take precedence over the priority, which is following Jesus. And here with the second man, we see that Jesus called people to him who were not concerned about financial gain. Jesus knew that those who had other priorities, and here with this man, it's financial gain, would not be true disciples. How often has our finances, our financial gain, limited you and me from really following Jesus? How often? Don't we trust Him? Don't we trust His promises in terms of the fact that He will supply all our needs according to His riches in Christ Jesus? John D. Rockefeller. You remember him? Some of you anyway. John D. Rockefeller uh, gave us three rules for financial success. You know what those were? Well, being the great financial analyst that I am, I'm going to give you those three rules right now. Here it is. Financial, financial advice. Free. It's free. Number one rule, he said. Get up early. Go into work early. Second rule. Stay late at your work. Stay late at your work. Third rule. Find oil. Somehow the third rule negates the first two. But that's what he said. Well, you see, God, Jesus, in calling us to follow him, wants us to be free of depending upon our personal comfort or depending upon our financial gain. Jesus calls those to follow who are not concerned about personal comfort, who are not concerned about financial gain. Uh, that's what the Word is, is teaching us here. So how is it with you today? You who name the name of the Lord... Is he calling you to something? A greater commitment? Wholehearted commitment? You see, all of us can, can wane in our commitment to Jesus. Because that, that's life. That's why we need to live in daily repentance and forgiveness. We all need forgiveness. We need the gospel of Jesus every day because we all fall short even of, of wholehearted commitment, don't we? And we have that. And so, as we realize our brokenness and our inability to be free of all desire for personal comfort and our inability to, to let the finances go, there is Jesus. There is Jesus 
with arms open, saying, Come, come, I love you, I care for you. And you realize that the, the essence of discipleship is to realize what the hymn writer said, such love, such love of God in Jesus Christ, such love demands my life, my soul, my all. There it is. That's to follow Jesus with my all. We need Him. And there is forgiveness with Him. Even for those times when our comfort is what we're thinking about. When our finances seem to rule. There He's there calling us to repentance. The call to repentance is a work of grace. Scripture says, do you not know the kindness of the Lord? Do you not know the kindness of the Lord that is intended to lead you to repentance? Turning from that comfort. Turning from that money. To worship the Lord with all we have and with all we are. The story is told of a, a master who was talking to a servant one day and the master said to the servant, what is it about you? You seem to have something I don't have. What is it? And the servant said, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. The master said, I want what you have. I want this Jesus. The servant said to him, all right, I'll tell you what you need to do. You come with us, put on first your bright white suit, put on your clean white suit, come with us and work with us all day in the mud and you'll meet Jesus there. Master said, no, I'm not going to do that. All right, said the servant. But again, this master came a second time and said essentially the same thing. What is it about you? It's Jesus, the servant said. I want Jesus. The servant said, well, put on your white suit. Come down and work with us in the mud and you'll meet him. Master said, no, no way. Third time. Master said, what is it about you? Where does your joy come from? It's Jesus, said the servant. I want this. Jesus. And the servant said, as I've said before, put on your white suit. Come down and work with us in the mud and you'll meet him there. This time the master said, yes, I'll do it. I'm going to do it. And he was ready to do it. But then the servant said to him, you don't have to. What, said the master, I don't have to do it? No, said the servant, you don't have to do it. You just have to be willing to do it. And you see, that's the point. We, not, we may not be called to give up house, home, all our finances. But you and I must be willing. If the Lord said, leave and follow me, leave that wonderful house you have, would you do it? Are you willing? Or if the Lord said, I want you to be giving much more than a tithe to my work, are you willing? You see, that's the, that's the question here. Are you willing? Are you willing? And each of us must answer that question for ourselves in the, the private area of the, the human heart and will. Now as I hasten to bring this message to a conclusion, I want you to note this with me carefully. It's very important. Will you notice in the text, Jesus says there, for the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. We talked about this. You saw that. He has nowhere 
to lay his head. Notice the verb lay there. Turn with me to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, verse 30. You're familiar with this passage. John 19 and verse 30. Therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. This is at the cross now. He said, it is finished. And Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now the verb translated bowed his head or inclined his head is the same verb that we looked at in Matthew 8 and verse 20. For the Son of Man has nowhere to lay, to lay, to incline, to incline, to bow his head. Now, that, that's so powerful to me from God's Word that as Jesus uh, told uh, this would-be follower, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head, that same verb, translated lay, or in John 19, translated bowed his head, or inclined his head, so powerful because in John 19, we learn the one place where Jesus laid his head. Where was it, church? Where was it? It was at the cross. It was at the cross. Praise God. Praise God, the one who found no place to lay his head, who was a man of sorrows and of grief, found that place to lay his head, and it was at the cross, not for his sins, not for his shortcomings, not for his rebellions, not for his transgressions, but for you and for me. It was for us. He laid his head at that cross. And because of that, God's love there demands my life, my soul, my all. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for the fact that by your grace, for we are unable. But by your grace, we can follow you, follow your word, follow our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to do that as you direct us, as you lead us. And how we thank you for that finished work of Jesus and for the place where he lay his head. In his name we pray. Amen.